Good morning, Southside. Special welcome to any guests. Grateful to have you with us here this morning as we worship the living God together. May this be welcome to 2024. Hallelujah, huh? May this be the year that the Lord Jesus Christ returns and consummates his work of redemption culminating in our eternal state where we'll dwell with God in shalom and peace for all of eternity. That is the blessed hope. Come, Lord Jesus, let us hasten this day as the body of Christ. As we begin this morning, I just wanted to share a couple of announcements. We, uh, I I've, I've saw something. I've, I've been at Southside 25 years. I was there the first Sunday. Uh, it was a beautiful Sunday. If you weren't there, God was merciful to us in many ways. But um, we were down, going into the last week of the year, $100,000 in our budget. And I, I've been just pulling a Hudson Taylor, going before God, praying and trusting and asking. And in the last week, we, we went over $5,000 over the budget. So uh, praise God for His mercy and kindness as we keep trying to guide the church for the best, most faithful ways to advance the kingdom. But thank you for all your uh, love and faithfulness and giving and worshiping God through your giving. That was a, a great encouragement uh, to our hearts. Uh, lots going on in the body. Um, I know Betty Foley um, broke her, her back. And so if you would be praying for that sweet saint and um, Ken Pruitt, Praise the Lord, he's back worshiping with us. We were thinking he was going to have open heart surgery at the beginning of the week, and he ended up getting some stents, and he is sitting here now worshiping with us, and so we are grateful to have our dear brother back with us. Uh, praise be to God. Friday was a, a tough day, kind of a, my own son and daughter, they feel like to me. I've known them a long, long time and have done their wedding, and Austin and Claire Lease. Um, uh, Claire Lease was um, 35 weeks pregnant and went into the ER this week, and she was having some back spasms and coughing, uh, and they're about to send her home, and her, I think it was her OBGYN, said, let's at least do an x-ray of her lungs, and they found a very, very large mass between her lung and heart, and uh, the day just started spinning quickly. Um, and so there were some tough decisions. Her life is at stake if she goes into labor um, and they needed to do biopsies and they were trying to figure this whole thing out. And I think I watched 50 doctors come in and out because it's a training hospital uh, just with different things and views and how to attack this. And I mean, it was just overwhelming. And I just watched Grace on display as this young lady is just trusting Christ and uh, in joy and accepting his will. And the, all the doctors are like, what, what is this? And it's just so beautiful to see God meet this young lady at a time like this and Austin's love for her and just coming together and trust. And so they got through some very serious surgeries. Uh, her biopsy was taken and we'll get results on Monday or Tuesday to find out what treatments will follow. And then there was a C-section and a beautiful little girl named Belle has come into this world and uh, just healthy. Just praise God for all that he did there. So let's continue to pray for them and as the body of Christ, um, help them. One of my joys was a bunch of young marrieds came over to the Nicolaituses and they just poured out their hearts before God interceding for them. And so just the way the body is coming alongside each other uh, has been very, very beautiful. So thank you for being the body of Christ to each other. Well, we start a new year this morning. And so I'm, I'm one of these weird people. Maybe you're weird too. I just love a new year. I, I like it for different reasons in the world. I, I just, I like time markers. I, li I like to look back at how I spent the last year and then ask God for grace. How can I grow more in Christ and this new year, they're kind of these time blocks. I, I've always said it's, time, it's like a dollar bill time is you can spend it any way you want, but you can spend it only once. And so how did I spend last year? And then how do I want to spend it this year in light of the greatest reality known to man that God sent his son into the world to save it? And so I want to live every day as if the Lord is going to return at the end of it. I don't want to shrink back when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, but to run to it, to long for that coming. And so I have a new year to, to laser my focus on one thing I do, said Paul. 
I forget what lies behind and I reach forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I just want to be done with lesser things and I've already thrown off several of them on January 1st. And I want to give my heart, mind, soul, and voice to serve the King of Kings. And I just want to call you as the body of Christ. Let's, let's join hands and do the exact same thing together. So, what I would like to do this morning um, as we begin this new year and come to the table and we're going to bring on new members at the end, it's a little different than normal. If you're visiting, we like to just exposit the Word of God through books. And this morning's a little bit um, topical and even... Um, it's just different. So when I'm done, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, I want to continue from a sermon I did, I think it was last year or two years ago on the local church as we started the new year. We looked at, at what is the local church. And, and this morning, um, the, I just think the church is so not understood in our day and age. And the visible church is, is shrinking at a rapid rate in America and we're watching on social media and all over the place these deconstructions of faith, people walking away from their faith in Jesus Christ. And the church has lost its saltiness in many areas. And, and the only way you can lose saltiness is for dirt to come into salt, and that's the worldliness. And the church has just become worldly. We're, 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 we're killing the light that we should be. So apostasy is rampant. Its power and effectiveness is becoming rare. And yet there's these beautiful things going on in the church in America of some real strengthening revitalizations and dying churches and the gospel going forth. I met with four youth, um, and when I say youth, I'm an old guy, so that's in their 20s, okay? And just living sinful, destructive lives and so radically saved just born again. The, the one gentleman wept with me for one hour during our whole meeting. He said, I, I don't cry in front of people. And he's so overwhelmed with the gospel that he just can't quit weeping. And so there's just something. I went to DU and I, I preached at FCA and I think the most we ever had was like 50 or 60. And there's like 125 kids jammed in there listening to the gospel, just attentive. And I'm hearing about this all over our campuses. There, there's something mighty that God is doing uh, in our day. But the church is God's design and plan for the advancement of his kingdom. This is God's plan, and it's essential. And if our government says it isn't, don't listen. This is the, the most essential thing that Christ made and gave us the church. This is the place that people get birthed into the kingdom and they're brought into it. And all of these gifts and what God has structured it is for us to grow up into the Lord Jesus Christ and graduate and go to heaven and get your finish line. So this is a gift of God. It's my greatest joy to grow up into Jesus Christ together. The church is my life. It's why all hell is thrown against it, to not let God accomplish his purposes for it. But Jesus said the gates of hell will not overcome it. But don't be surprised that all hell is set against the church and your own heart giving yourself to the bride of Christ. Everything will be against it. So don't spend your days criticizing it, slandering it, apathetic to it, half in and half out, being a spectator, distant, holding your heart and your gifts from it. One of the best mistakes you could ever make is that. This is the bride of Christ. He gave his blood for it. With all of its weaknesses and warts until glory, this is the place that God grows us and sanctifies us. And he even uses our weaknesses and our sins to grow us and to strengthen us and to deepen us for his glory. The bride of Christ, how I love her. I love that song we just sang, when we're saved to sin no more. This ransom church right here, all I could picture was what we're going to look like when we're saved to sin no more. We have a blessed hope. Let's go to our God and pray, and we're going to look at the church this morning. Father, we come before you, and I thank you for sending your son into this world to redeem a people for himself to create a bride, a bride that will gather and worship and a, a bride that will seek to be conformed to your image and a bride that will seek to tell this gospel to the ends of the nations. 
God, thank you. Thank you for this. I pray this morning that your spirit would move and you would work in every one of our hearts to see the beauty of what you've designed and that we would be done with dating the church. God, that we would give ourselves wholly to the bride of Christ for your glory so that we would bear much fruit and people would glorify God as we saw in John 15. Father, please do that in our midst this morning. I pray. Amen. So by way of introduction, when we began this church, this is the verse that was our theme verse. Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Paul said, we proclaim him, Jesus Christ. We preach him. Admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete, mature, uh, growing in Jesus Christ. And Paul said, for this purpose, I labor to the point of fatigue striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. I'm laboring, Paul says, by his power to with everything I've got within me to see you presented complete and mature in Jesus Christ. That's our goal. That is what we're running toward. That's what I've given my life to since we planted this church 25 years ago. That is the goal to the glory of God in John 15, that you bear much fruit and God gets the glory from that fruit. And so what I would like to do then is talk about how the church is structured to bring this about. I've never done a sermon on this, and I just felt led that it was the right way to start 2024. Without vision, our people perish. I want you just to understand the bride of Christ. And as we begin, what am I giving myself to? Um, a, A while back, I think a bunch of the elders, we read a book called The Trellis and the Vine. And it's a beautiful work on looking at the church and trying to analyze how do we we build a trellis. So when you look at at a vineyard, the the trellis is to hold the grapevine and and you need enough trellis so that it can organically grow. If you don't have any trellis, it's going to die. It's not going to work. And if you got too much trellis, it's not going to organically grow. And so we started looking at the church where what is the trellis that the Bible gives us to and then wisdom and as God guides and leads the elders, what is the trellis that we're to set up in the church? And, and, and it's just like a lot of you want less government and, and some of you want less trellis. And so we're always trying to find this balance of wisdom is how much trellis is necessary for the vine, the organic Uh, people of God to grow and and bear much fruit like we've been learning about in John 15. So if you have too little trellis, and I've seen this before, um, go ahead and answer it. I'll wait. No. Um, (laughs) So if you have too much trellis, it it can kill the body. And all of a sudden, it's just all about admin. It's, it's all about these different details and things. So we, we, we can get too much or you can have too little where we need some structure for, for all of this to work and, and for us to just organically grow. You probably can't even hear that phone ringing, can you? Okay, I can. Um, is, is your name Maxwell Smart? That was your shoe ringing. <laughs> So this is so important to the church then to find this balance so the great gardener can grow his plant. And so this is so important. And I want to make sure that the whole church then understands what is the trellis at Southside Bible Church that we believe God uses as a means to bring this about for your organic, supernatural growth to bear much fruit. And, and so I, I want you to hear one thing that means a lot to me. No trellis can grow any saint. I believe that with all my heart. There, there's no uh, way you can ad, ad, administrate and make people grow. So it, we set a trellis knowing that it's God alone who causes the growth. And so it's a church that's always dependent and praying and looking for God to work in our midst. We want as little trellis as possible to let the vine grow and blossom and bear much fruit. So we've been learning in John 15, as we abide in Christ, you'll bear much fruit and the Father will be glorified. Now we're looking at how do we do that corporately? 
where, where all these trellises are working as we abide in Christ to bear much fruit. Why? So that God will get all the glory. And so the way I would like to tackle this this morning is I want to give you this broad outline. I, I, I like um, broad outlines and it helps me hang things on it and then we'll narrow with each point. So the, I'm going to start with the three goals of the church and we established these when we began 25 years ago. <clears throat> what are we shooting at? If you shoot at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So the first is we want to exalt God, we want to edify the saints, and we want to evangelize. So to exalt God, uh, Jesus told us in John 4, the Father is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So God is looking for worshipers, those who now from the inside that know the gospel and get new hearts worship Him in, in our very soul and in the truth of this gospel and who He is. And so what he wants is worshipers. And so I pray that you get this church exists that we gather to worship the living God. And we believe that by expositing the word of God day in and day out in Sunday schools, in worship services, in community groups, that it will produce this because the scriptures are not man-centered. They're theocentric. From him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. You stay in the scriptures and you keep studying them, you're going to get a high view of God and you're going to want to worship him. You don't finish reading the Bible and say, man, I am really special. It just, I want to exalt God. And so as we keep teaching this word, I pray that what's stirring up within you is worship. And we walk in and they just hit one note and your heart, tune my heart to sing thy praise. You are ready to sing praise to your God who has redeemed you through Jesus Christ. And so we seek Sundays to be a worship service. This is our time to gather and forget everything else and just sing praises to our God. I came across this trip, uh, book, not trip, a book by Paul Tripp, and it's called Sundays Matter. And I'm just going to ask that everybody in the church get this book so that we're all going through it together. It's just, you do it on Saturday nights, and it's just getting your heart ready. He said he grew up where they never missed church, but they were never trained or taught how to come get the most out of church. And this book is beginning to really set your heart to get ready to come and get the most out of this worship service. So it's called Sundays Matter. And I just want to encourage you, and especially moms and dads, this would be a great way to train and teach your kids um, as singles. Um, it's just, it's such a good way to get your mind and heart ready to come in to worship. And, and, and today his, his book said, you, you come in to worship and we're broken. We're not the perfect people. And you're coming in and you're just crying out, God, I need you. I need, I need your help. I need, I need to understand. I need clarity. And so we're just kind of gathering together this morning, not perfect people, just looking to a perfect God and crying out for his help. So I think that book's going to help. You can, you can go through the Psalms as a great way every, every Sunday morning to prepare your heart. So come ready to worship God for who he is and what he's done and what he will do. And then Romans 12:1. We also worship God by offering up our bodies a living sacrifice to him. Um, here you go, God. Here's my life. We want to make God look good by the way we live our lives unto him. So we want to worship by giving ourselves to God. And then so we worship him in song and praise, and we worship him by what we do every day, all day long. And so the obedience of faith was the theme of Romans so that God would be glorified. So I, I pray that we would be a church that we worship God. He's worthy, amen? amen? And then second, we're to edify the saints. Uh, Sean read in Ephesians 4, we have the unity of the Spirit. Why do we want unity? So that all our gifts will work together to build us up into the head, that we might look like Jesus Christ. And so we're going to kind of park there this morning. But, but one of the reasons the church exists is for us to, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ together, and we're interdependent. We're, we're connected, and we, we need each other in that part of the journey. And then the third thing is we're to evangelize. This is the best message ever. I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. 
I want every soul on this earth to hear this amazing gospel. Why? I want to see haters of God become worshipers of God back to our first point. And so we want to see this gospel go out anywhere and everywhere. So I want to start with a call to the elders to shepherd the flock of God. Um, I think it was Paul, Timothy, appoint elders in every place. And so there's elders that are going to be overseers. And what I want you to see then is they're, they're called to be shepherds. And I just, I, I was teaching the MTP a while back and I came across this book on, on shepherding and it just kind of traced shepherding. And I just want to give you a quick outline of shepherding from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament has this biblical imagery that's so rich of Yahweh as the shepherd of his people. Uh, it's, it's throughout the Old Testament. You all know Psalm 23 well. And that's just that great picture of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you, just, you get this picture of, of God being a, a shepherd to his flock. Listen to Psalm 96 or 95. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand today if you would hear his voice. And so God is this shepherd and we're his pasture and you just are a sheep in the pasture. Um, and then Isaiah 40, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead his nursing ewes. And so just this beautiful picture of Old Testament of God as a shepherd of his people. And then we see the principle then in the Old Testament that God would put humans over his flock to shepherd it as earthly shepherds. Some of the good examples are Moses and David. And so these, these men were put over to be shepherds over the people. And what we see through the Old Testament was what was the problem with the human shepherds? And we see again and again is sin and times they would mistreat and abuse the flock of God. And so as we're watching him saying, you're, you're not being true shepherds. And he's, he makes this promise, there's going to be a shepherd who's going to come and he's going to be the good shepherd. He's going to be the great shepherd who will shepherd his flock. And I just want to read to you Micah 5.2 through 4. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. And his going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. The shepherd is eternal. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has born a child. Then the remainder of his, the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel, and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. And so there's this great promise of one who's going to be born in a manger in Bethlehem, and he's going to be the shepherd who will come and he will shepherd his people. And we come into the New Testament, and he comes into John 10, and he says, I am the good shepherd. I'm the one that all this has been pointing to. I'm, I'm the one who will cause you to lie down in green pastures, and goodness and love and kindness will follow you all the days of your life. I'm that shepherd of Psalm 23. And then he tells us, I'm going to go away and I'm going to give the church shepherds. Jesus would give shepherds when he leaves and the spirit would indwell them now. So they'd be spirit-filled shepherds and they would be called and gifted to be the under shepherds of his flock. And so let's look at how Jesus then has provided for his bride that he shed his blood for in 1 Peter 5. One through five, I'll read that for you. If you want to turn, you can. If not, I will be reading it. First Peter five, one. <clears throat> Therefore, I exert the, the elders, which is shepherd, among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that's to be revealed. I've seen his glory and I saw him die on a cross. Shepherd the flock of God among you exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. 
And when the chief shepherd appears, Jesus, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud and he gives grace to the humble. And so pastor, the the Latin word means shepherd. In fact, it's used this way as a shepherd more than any other terminology. So shepherding is at the very heart of the leadership of the church. And so elders, pastors, bishops, overseers are to be a team shepherding the flock of God that they have been appointed to in that local assembly. And so the most fundamental thing that we should look for in selecting elders as nominations are coming up is for a shepherd's heart. That's got to be the primary orientation is that they want to shepherd the flock of God uh, by the Spirit of God through the truth of God. Shepherding, I think it's a dying thing in our land. People don't even know what it is anymore because elders have become a board of directors, not shepherds. Pastors in America have ceased to be shepherds for the most part, and the laity doesn't even know anything different. They don't expect anything different. We're just left alone to grow and get through life, gather for a service on Sunday and go back at it alone. And that can't be it. I love when Jesus looked out at the multitudes. It says he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. His heart is, I want to give them shepherds. So as we begin this morning, as we're trying to shepherd the flock of God, the first question then is, as shepherds, who who are we to oversee? Who are we to shepherd? And that's the flock of God. And so as we begin at Southside Bible Church, we have something called church membership. And so what, I, I can't shepherd every soul. And so the elder board is, is where we're coming is when someone comes, I want to join this local assembly. I want to become a member. And so Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, you're, you elders are going to give an account for the sheep. And so that's a weighty thing, that when you stand before God, you're going to give an account for the sheep. And so therefore, church membership is to come into the body of Christ and say, I want to be a member at Southside Bible Church. And so the way we bring people in is there's two, two things that we see in the New Testament that we're looking for. And one is that you're a believer. I, I can't shepherd goats. So the, the one is that you have come to faith in Jesus Christ. That you have come under to realize that you're under the wrath of God for your sin against him on a daily basis. And you, you cannot get that wrath off of you by going to church, by cleaning up your life, by getting baptized. There is no way to get that wrath off of you. And you've come to see that Jesus hung on a cross and he drained that wrath of God so that there's not even a drop left for you this morning. And you've come to faith in that and it's not just academic, it's here's my life. You, you died in my place and I am surrendering all to you. And those are the ones that come in to the body of Christ. So I, I, I'm not all knowing. We hear testimonies, all the elders listen and, and there's a testimony of what I just shared and we're saying, okay, come into the body of Christ and then that you've been baptized. We have classes that teach you to understand what does it mean to be a member But I just want you to understand that membership is big before God. I'm giving myself to this local assembly to be led and to use my gifts for the building up of the body and their gifts to build me up in Christ. And so it it takes a commitment. It takes that I am getting in and I'm giving my life to come in and and grow up into the head. This this is is big because some of you are playing with this and you're not doing it. And so I want you to, before God, to hear his design for your good. Don't slap it. A good hand. A hand that's trying to bless you and grow you. And you're like, I got my own ideas how to grow. I don't need all you smelly sheep. 
So once you're in the fold, then we're called to shepherd the flock of God. And what we began, I want to remind you one more time, is called biblical pastoral oversight. And so all the members now are broken up um, under different elders. And those elders are now, they're going to focus on that group to shepherd. Because what, what happens is if you, it, I try to run to every need possible, and I've been doing that for 25 years, and it's a stupid way to shepherd the flock of God. I've taken 20 years off my life. It doesn't work. I'll share about that in a second. But you need overseers to help you and to, and to, and to keep you growing. So our goal is that you at least get two phone calls to see how are you doing, how can we pray for you, any needs, any struggles, where are you at, uh, help you get plugged into the body if you're not. So just to love you and nurture you, and then when you have needs, you, you will call that shepherd, and he's going to just have this very specific care and be praying for you weekly for your souls. And so there'll, there'll be oversight for the whole body. And, and again, that's what, what I learned is I need your help. I, God put within me this weird gift of mercy. And it, I just don't know how to say no. Like if, if a sheep's hurting, I just, I go. And my wife, she's got a terrible gift of saying, I want you to go serve the body. <laughs> I'm like, are you good? Yes. And I, sh I wasn't wise enough to say, maybe she isn't. And so I'm learning and we're, we're growing. But I'd run to every need. And what I started learning is that's not the best for the body. It's not the best for me. Um, it's just, it's sin. It's sin on my part. To not let all the elders and the whole body shepherd and help and grow. And so I must decrease and he must increase. And so I repent before God for, it's just pride. That's pride. And it was in the way of this body growing the way it should. So I need your help to, to call your elder instead of me. <laughs> okay? Because I'm a knucklehead. I know what I'm going to do. And I'm trying harder and harder to say no. Um, I can say no because I know you have an elder overseeing you well. So I just want you to, to help your old pastor and go to your elders, okay? Okay, we're all elders, we're all pastors. And so forgive your, your pastor for being a knucklehead. It was out of love, but it was wrong. So we don't want to lose any sheep. We want to protect them and feed them. I guess what I want more than anything is for you to lie down in green pastures, contented in Christ. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. I want every one of you to live in that place. I'm so filled with Christ, I don't need anything else. I want to fatten you up. I know a lot of resolutions were to lose weight, and I'm trying to get you to gain it. I just want you eating green grass and happy and content and buying and just so happy in Christ. I want you to learn how not to go into Fort Knox of God and come out with 25 cents, but I, I want you to learn how to live into the fullness of who God is. Guys, I, I'm watching our sweet little young marrieds group. Last year, one of our couples had to bury their, their sister. And then Fred and Logan, she got struck with a disease that when I went in that hospital, I almost threw up with the pain that she was in. And, and just, and now with Austin and Claire Lise and all these things, and what I'm watching is these guys are drawing near to God. And they're trusting him and they're praying and they're bringing meals and they're, they're carrying each other the way they should. And, and this is just what's going on in the whole body. It's beautiful. I want you to know the fullness of God and how to live in a vine and a branch. So that's our goal is to, to shepherd you into that where you learn how to live in the fullness of Jesus Christ. I can't do anything for you. Jesus can do everything. 
And we just want to keep pointing you to him from every angle. So how are we going to edify you? How are we going to grow you up, church of God? What means is God given? And so here's our commitment. Is I believe this word is inspired by God. Every jot and tittle, is, this is the word of God. And, and I, I can't outdo Steven Spielberg and give you entertainment and do all these things. I can give you the word of God. And all the elders are 100% convinced that that is the power, is the word of God getting into your minds and your hearts and renewing you. So the commitment of this church in everything that we do is the word of God. It's your only hope. Come say, give me the eternal word. I don't want to hear what you think. Come give me God's thoughts. And so every sermon, I desire that it's expository. It's drawing out the meaning from God's word. Every Sunday school class is the word of God. Thank you for those who are teaching the little kids and and what's going on in the youth group. Hallelujah. Just keep teaching the word of God. Community groups we've developed so that the body can cause the growth of the body. And every one of those groups is to have the word of God and us pouring it into each other, using our gifts, getting into each other's lives, being transparent, praying, community groups, fellowships, churches open forever till one o'clock and food and men and women meetings and retreats. And you got directories to call each other. Just that's how we're going to edify each other. The word of God. But, but there's more. I graduated seminary and I thought, all a church is is you get up and exposit the Word of God. And it took me 10 years to figure out there's more. There's more. There's a lot more. There's a great commission. And that great commission is to go and make disciples. That's the main command in the great commission. Go make followers of Jesus Christ. And so we want to make sure that you're growing and you're becoming imitators of Jesus Christ in every area of your life. And because of remaining sin, a devil, and a world, it's just not a straight shot to glory, is it? Has anyone figured out life's hard? It's a hard path to glory. And the bottom line is we're going to need help. And it's not that, hey, you see this in Scripture and go, This is so easy. Now I can just go live it out. Thank you, God. Does anyone have that experience? I I need help. I need the body. I've never realized more how much I need the body to help me. I'll fall off a cliff without God and you guys. And so we must be a church committed to personal discipleship. And that's all of us giving ourselves to each other with all of our gifts to help you learn how to be pleasing to God in your day-to-day life. We all have different strengths and understandings and experiences. I love that. One of the neat things about being a pastor is I get to hear all the different stories and who God brings together in the local assembly is a joy. It's the best puzzle I have ever seen in my life. And so we all have these different ways and strengths. And and so my favorite way is what I'm going to call organic. And I'm not talking about food. Organic, I mean, it just happens the way God has designed it in the body. And so we get in and we start meeting and connecting and saying, hey, you want to get together and start reading John together? You want to go out and start evangelizing with me? I had, uh, I had two couples ask my brother, hey, do you want to just meet and help us strengthen our marriages? I had a guy home from uh, uh, the Marines and just say to his, to his community group leader, will you call me every week and start helping me grow? I have a guy who's struggling uh, with some finance and on the job and, and just saying, one of our deacons, uh, can you disciple me? Uh, just, I just want you to see, be looking for mentors. Be looking for people to help you learn how to journey from here to glory. So organic is, you know you need it and you're looking for it and ask and get to meet people and say, can you help me in this area? I don't even know how to change oil. You want to help me do it to the glory of God. There's just a million things that we need to learn from each other. And so we're going to have organic discipleship, and it's springing up, and that's the kind that I like the most. Then we've got what's called, it used to be called counseling, and it's called focused discipleship now. 
And one of our deacons, Jared Hazlett and Joel George and Nate Thompson, have been laboring on this for a long time. And it's just, I, I love where they've landed and the development of it. So if you come to a place where I need specific discipleship in this area, I need help. I need help getting through this specific struggle. We, we've got it. We've got to tra train people. And you go to the website and it's called Focus Discipleship. And then you hit Ministries and it says care and discipleship support. And in three weeks, Jared's going to explain all that to you because I'm horrible at computers. Um, but I do, all I want you to get this morning is there's a way that we want to help you grow. So if you're struggling in some sin or, or just you can't get out of it, don't do it alone. Come and let the body of Christ help you grow through that battle. So please don't battle and sin alone. That is the worst thing that you could do. Come get help. I beg you. So if you need specific help or you want to be trained to do that specific help, we need both. Jared is going to be um, talking and taking volunteers. And then another area is called CTO. It's a call to obedience that I've been working on this year, and it's a discipleship manual with three booklets. And it's, if you do it once a week, it's about six months, and it requires about an hour and a half of homework. And so it's a real commitment, but it's, it's digging in to laying some foundations to your Christian life. And the fruit that I'm beginning to see in it has been unbelievable. And what it did in me and Laura's life as we were discipled uh, has been a blessing. And so what I like about it is it's reproducible. So I have so many people say, I'd, I, I'd like to disciple, but I don't know how to. And now you, you can have this material to take somebody else through. And so the goal is to just keep reproducing and helping each other in these areas. So the goal is that, that the body would cause the growth of the body and that, that the only way you're ever going to grow is by abiding in Jesus Christ. And that all these things that we're talking about are going to keep pointing you to how to, to trust Christ more, to love him more, to obey him more. And we're just all working together for that to happen. And so we, we plug in to the body so that it'll cause the growth of the body. And all of our gifts will work together to help each other grow. So that's the trellis for your growth in Christ. And what I would like to exhort you to this morning is to give yourself to it. Pray that God will meet us in power and take this trellis and make it organic and give us abundant, abiding fruit so that God will get all the glory. I know that structure can't do anything. I know that we need the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us and in these ways of the Word of God being taught in all different manners that He would grow us up to look like Jesus Christ. So pray, 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 pray for God to pour the fire on the altar that is our trellis. And thirdly, evangelize. Evangelize. Since I got saved, the Lord put this so strongly upon my heart. I got saved out of a very sinful life. I had a group of friends from kindergarten, about 30 of us, that met every Friday and Saturday and, and did abominations. God saved me out of it. And I was so excited to come tell them what happened to me? It was just, I was just so full. And I went to our big party. It was, it was uh, I think, a toga party. <laughs> and I went to it and I told them all about Jesus and it did not go as I planned. So I've just been a little sniper ever since, just picking them off one at a time over the last 30 years. But it just, it bleeds in my heart. How do we take this gospel to the world? I've been asking myself this since I got saved. And that question needs to be answered. And I've tried so many ways. I've gone into the prisons, halfway houses, Colfax. I remember our Thanksgiving dinner with a stripper and all our young kids at the table and her family. College and career, we started what was called the Church of the Homeless and we would just go down to the park and we would sit and love them and share the gospel and worship and sing. And they said, look, we have people feed us 
but we've never, by becoming our own church, they said, we, there, there's a bondedness. And we, so we saw some amazing things happen. Then we started, we passed marijuana, the gangs came in, and they threatened them, and no one ever came again to our church service. I've jumped into every possibility, and I believe that we should. I think we should go to the highways and byways and compel them to come in. A young man last Sunday, just going door to door, his heart was overtaken, and he got to share with six people, and he wants to just continue to spread it. The other ways I've tried is just preaching it wherever I can. Any wedding, any funeral, Christmas, Easter, whatever it is, the gospel is going to come out. Just preach it anywhere and everywhere you can for those gatherings. And so I've been doing that for 25 years. The other is we, we ran into this, we began the new year with a call to mission last year. And it was trying to equip the whole church for how to do evangelism, but it was evangelism by when you meet people day to day, relationships uh, that stores, neighbors, all of these ways to start connecting and leading into the gospel. And so your, your community groups, and, and so this is really the way I've seen the most fruit. And I know there's different seasons in countries where it used to be in England, you could just preach on the street and everybody would come and listen. And I just think more and more there's an opportunity, it's golden, and get out there and meet people and begin going to that step of leading it to the gospel. And then something happened beautiful this year, the Christmas concert. Um, I thought we'd have 15 people there. <laughs> and it's packed with hundreds and hundreds of people. And I, I never, I talked to so many unbelievers that night. You guys did the work of evangelism. You went out and brought them in and the gospel went out by song and word. And uh, let's just double that next year. Those, those stents are to double the Christmas choir next year, brother. Let's go. And then on Christmas Eve, well done. That was, that was the most unbelievers I've had since I've been preaching on Christmas Eve. So you're, you're getting out and you're doing the work of evangelism. And you're, everyone I met at the Christmas concert said, hey, someone from your church has been reaching out and kind of telling me about Jesus. And so you're, you're telling, you're sharing. That's what I want to see. Just the gospel, like it's, you just got to speak it because it's so glorious to your own heart. So I need you to dream and pray to start up anything outreach, and I need to get moving. We don't have the budget to have a full-time evangelism pastor. If anyone wants to donate that, see me afterwards. Uh, instead, it's the body rising up and starting outreaches door-to-door. -door. We, we have uh, a group that is with abortions fighting against it. Um, I, I went to Chick-fil-A, and there were 30 families with toddlers in there. Man, that is a place to evangelize. Um, I'm going there once a week. Um, park, when, when spring comes, everybody goes out to the park and we're going to flood into those parks with our little babies and grandbabies and tell them about Jesus. So I just want you to dream and think, how do I proclaim this gospel anywhere and everywhere? And the next thing is church planting. I was reading that the percentage of unchurched people that will attend a church plant is like 70% higher than ever walking into an established church. And so church planning is a great way to begin outreaching into a community. Paul Washer said, if I could do one thing in my life, I'd plant a church. And that's our passion and our pursuit. We've planted two over the last two and a half years or so. Um, we've planted in North Denver, and we've planted a church in Tijuana. And now we, we kind of have a sister church now in, a, in Elizabeth with Brendan McMillan as he's going to take that over, and we'll be doing things with them so we're, we're working with a church planting network called Crossway. Uh, they're, they're experienced a lot in how to do this church planting. We're just trying to learn and get wisdom. There's a new thing called church revitalizations where churches are dying all over Colorado and you go in and you, you take over and you revitalize those churches in, in that area. And so we've got um, some areas where we're trying to move forward and that uh, more to share maybe uh, in the future. So this is all of us. I love that last church plant. The whole body just was over there cleaning and prepping it and how many went over there to help them and leading music. And uh, it's just, it's a whole body that came together to plant a church. That's beautiful. And then missions, we just keep learning. Uh, we have a missions committee and they're working hard to help equip and the, the ones who are already over there to take this gospel to the world. 
And right now we've got several couples and some singles who are being led by God and some families uh, to take the gospel to the different parts of the world. Um, I'm blessed to see God moving in your hearts to, as the man prayed this morning, to give up the American dream to go take this gospel to different parts of the world. So let's keep praying for them. And so pray because all hell is set against churches being planted. And, and I know that he's been coming hard at us as we've been focusing our narrowing in on that. And I want us to keep praying for our dear friends in Spain, the Leightons as well. So guys, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. That's the trellis that we've established. And I wanted the church to understand it. I won't do this again. We're going to start expositing the Word of God. But I just wanted this morning for you to know what is Southside Bible Church and how do I get in and how can I grow and use my gifts in all of these areas. So the vine can grow organically by God alone using these means. And so... Um, the prayer group on Sunday mornings, we've been seeing God answer so many prayers. And so I just want us to keep knocking at the throne of grace together and ask God to do these things. So my assessment of the last 25 years is that those who have given themselves to the body of Christ in this way have grown. And as I'm going to hospital beds and, and all these different places, I, I'm overwhelmed with how much you've grown in Christ and how much you trust him. And it's those who have given themselves to the body of Christ. It's beautiful to watch. My heart is so blessed that you're walking in the truth. And what I love is Jesus said, the gates of hell will not overcome the church. It may smolder and flicker, but God will see to it that it will be the church victorious and he will do it through suffering. So give yourself to the church of God. Love it, treasure it, join it. Jump in with all of its warts and shortcomings and sin until we see Jesus. And the writer of Hebrews said, let us consider then how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need each other more than ever as this day is really hastening. And so let's, I had another exhortation I'll save for next week. We're one body, and I want every wall down between each other, between community groups. Jesus broke down the wall, and we are all one, agonizing and striving together to make much of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the beauty of this gospel. I thank you that you've had such a beautiful design of the church for how you would grow us and how you would take the gospel out. And so, Lord, we love the bride of Christ. We love that Jesus shed his own blood for it. He purchased us, a people for himself. God, thank you for our redemption. Lord, let us, let us respond and not forsake the assembling together. Let us dig in and stimulate how to stir one another up to love and good deeds. God, let us exalt you. Let us be worshipers let us edify and build up one another and let us evangelize and take this gospel to the nations. Lord, give us a heart as we look at Jesus Christ hanging on a cross as the motivation for everything that we do. For I've resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. To him be the glory forever. Amen.